appear in the front. Welcome, everybody. Um, I just have a few announcements to make very quickly. The first and most important is that the ladies' bathroom is not functional. I think it's because we're in an old engineering building that women probably were absent. So they didn't think about having extra bathrooms for women. It's under construction. But so the women use the men's um, upstairs. You're welcome to use the men's. It's now become a co-ed bathroom. Um, OK, so I'm Michelle Williams. I'm one of the coordinators of this seminar series, this lecture series. I'd just like to recognize my two other co-coordinators, Vishwa Sapka and Devin Pillay. Where the he is? Oh, right. Devin Pillay. Um, I also would like to thank the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation for their support for the Democratic Marxism Energy Volume Series that this seminar series grows out of. And actually, Mitch Press, who publishes the series, is here tonight selling books in the back. So please, um, academic publishing, like everything else, is a dying thing, and they need your support. So if you have the means, please buy a book. Um, I'd also like to thank the sociology and international relations departments and all my all our colleagues in these departments and the school more generally for making sociology, IR, the School of Social Sciences, a congenial home and a place for robust debate. Um, thanks especially to our administrators in sociology, Ingrid, um, Satani, and Josephine. They are phenomenal and do an amazing job, and a lot of the background work here is done by them. And I'd also like to thank Jane Cherry uh, and Noah Swazi. They are also the engines here. They did the pretty posters and helped us set up, and um, so they're around as well. Tonight is our second public lecture of the Democratic Marxism Lecture Series. The first one was in March, and now we have this one, and then we're going to have two more very quickly because of the speakers' uh, schedules. On the 4th of August, I'm just announcing this, the 4th of August at 12 noon, we have Eric Olin Wright speaking on class, and Sarah Mitzwetza will be the respondent. And then on August 11th, uh, at 5 o'clock, we have Vivek Chibber speaking on Marxism and post-colonialism, and Ashil they will be the discussant. And then in September, we're going to have one on feminism and Marxism, and um, in October, Marxism and race. So there's a number still to come, and we hope to see everybody at those as well. So the idea of this whole series has been to engage and interrogate Marxism against various traditions. Um, and we, many of us, about, I think about 30 of us, 20 or 30 of us, have just had an intensive week of engagement with Michael giving us lectures and um, going through some of the various Marxist texts. Um, and it's been incredibly rewarding. And this, for, for those of us who have been in the seminar series, this now is the culmination of the week of seminars. Um, so let me say something about our speakers. It's an enormous pleasure, it's, it's an absolute enormous pleasure to have one of the world's leading sociologists and leading Marxist scholars. Um, but Michael is special to us for other reasons than just being one of the world's leading sociologists and Marxist scholars. He has a long-standing relationship with Witt and with South Africa, and he's had he demonstrated his commitment to this continent and Southern Africa in particular for 40, 50 years, 66, 50 years. Wow. Um, so Michael first came to South Africa in 1966, where he met Luli Kalinikas and Eddie Webster before Luli and Eddie were Luli and Eddie. Um, and he spent four years from 1968 to 72 in Zambia studying the Zambian copper industry. This, is, this experience in Zambia was important for two reasons, I think. I mean, I'm sure there are many, many other reasons for him. But for those of us who have read his work, it's been important for two reasons. First, it's where I think he pioneered and started his lifelong commitment to deep ethnographic studies and the extended case method. But it was also where he introduced the idea of the, I think I got it right, the upward floating color bar. Where that he, was Eddie's idea. That was Eddie's idea. <laughs> Okay, no. see, they, they started this, this incredible um, partnership of sorts 50 years ago, and it continues today, and it's quite a beautiful partnership at that. Um, so they came up with that, this idea that basically describes the workplace organization and post-colonial context, and that the continue, continued hierarchies that um, are in existence. 
His ethnographic work um, on factories in Chicago, Hungary, and Russia are considered foundational readings in labor studies. Books like The Manufacturing of Consent, Changes, Changes in the Labor Process and the Monopoly Capitalism, The, Ma the Politics of Production. And, and by the way, he, um, his book, Manufacturing Consent, is before Chomsky's book, Manufacturing Consent. Um, this is another book, Politics of Production, The Extended Case Method. All of these are among, I think, some of the most read books in their perspective fields. Um, and when I say he studied these places, I mean he actually went and he's a, he does real ethnography, and he's gone in and works as a machine operator in the factories for a year or more. Um, and I gather, and for our Numsa comrades, I saw some Numsa comrades here. Um, apparently, he's a horrible machine operator. So if he asks to do an ethnography, don't put him on your line. So I think he slows down the line, apparently. And he would tell his co-workers that he's really a professor, and so this is just the study he's doing. And they would tell me, yeah, we all have our fantasies. <laughs> so Michael, um, sorry, uh, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do here. Oh, I'm supposed to also announce this book with Carl von Holt, or do, uh, Conversations with Bordeaux that Michael wrote. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so he also studied state socialism in Hungary from 1982 to 1989, and the transition to capitalism in Russia 1991 to 2002. And I've said this before, you have to worry, because wherever Michael went, there was a transition out of socialism into capitalism. Um, so as you can see, though, he's also an internationalist in his intellectual as well as his personal commitments. Uh, he's, in his professional life, he's a professor of sociology at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the former president of the American Sociological Association and the International Sociological Association. And for those of you not in academia or in sociology, it's quite a feat to get a radical person voted into these positions. Um, and he changed both of these associations for quite a few years I and mean, continues today um, from, from the energies he put into that. Okay, so that's Michael Burgway, and I think we are incredibly lucky. He comes here um, and gives his time almost every year in South Africa because it's very special. So I think we owe him a great debt of, of thanks. And I, we also are extremely lucky to have Dilla Lennon um, be the discussant for Michael today. And when we were trying to think of someone who would be the perfect dis discussant, uh, Denon, Mish, and I all thought Dilla would be the perfect discussant because it's not quite clear. Is he a Marxist? Is he a not a Marxist? Is he anti-Marxist? But he definitely is a critical mind, no matter what he engages, and that's what we want. Someone who's going to interrogate um, and engage the Bible and his ideas. Um, Dilip is a Mellon Chair in Indian Studies, and he's the Director of the Center for Indian Studies in Africa here at FITS. His research um, in the past decade has engaged issues of caste, socialism, and equality in modern India. I personally came across Dillip's work when I was doing my PhD in the late 1990s, and I was highly impressed by the book he wrote on Kerala called Caste, Nationalism, and Communism, South India. Um, currently, he is working on issues of cultural and intellectual history and is engaged in a project on the writing of history in India between 1850 and 1960. Um, the work tries to look afresh at issues of colonialism, modernity, and migration in the global south. So Michael's going to have 55 minutes, and Dilith will have 15 minutes, and then we're going to open up for a discussion. Okay, thank you. Good. Thank you very much, Michelle. That's um, given me a lot to live up to. Um, and thank you, Michelle. Devon Fish for inviting me here to talk about, well, Southern Marxism. Um, I've been rather nervous today to be talking about this topic uh, in South Africa. Yeah. Where angels fear to tread, fools march in. Um, we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very grateful that Dillard is going to be a commentator and he will sort of re-equilibrate what I have to say, I hope. Um, so, uh, it's really great to be here. I have, I, in that, that, the book that uh, I wrote with, with Carl von Holt um, was actually a series of uh, seminars I held in this room, so it's, this is a familiar place to me. And, and I'm glad that uh, 
that there are so many people interested in Marxism in South Africa. I don't know if there are many other countries where <coughs> they can come and give a course, some a lecture on Marxism where there will be such interest. So that I already find very encouraging, which will be a point I will make later in this talk. Um, this, uh, this talk was, um, was conceived last year, uh, about this time last year, um, when, when I was having conversations with Vish uh, and Michelle, and uh, uh, I thought, you know, it's 40 years since Perry Anderson wrote his book, <laughs> Considerations on Western Marxism, and I thought, the time had come for us to sort of, or at least for me, to revisit it. Um, I, hadn't, I hadn't really taken it into account uh, since, for many years, and so what I, have, what I, what I imagined then um, uh, was a re-examination of that book in the light of the movement of Marxism um, from the West to the South. Um, I, in this, that what I decided to do um, in coming here, I've had a year to think about it, was actually to give um, three seminars that have been taking place on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, and uh, today is the sort of culminating seminar. Um, the idea of all these seminars, and they built upon each other, was to really give an overview um, of Marxist tradition and to show how interconnected that tradition is and that basically yes there may be a western and a southern marxism but they cannot be separated from one another that's really going to be the theme of my talk today um, and i'm going to do this by linking marx gramsci and fanon so let me just say a little bit about perry anderson's book since i suspect most of you have not read this book it was a very thin book um, probably thin in more than one way um, <laughs> It was uh, written uh, in 1976 um, when Marxism was being rediscovered in Great Britain. Uh, a particular type of Marxism, there was a discovery of European Marxism, um, what Perry Adams called Western Marxism. Um, he argued in this book there are two, basically two Marxisms, a classical Marxism, Marx, Engels, Luxembourg. Do, do you want to, to, is there some way you can enter this room? Um, uh, are you, can you hear me at the back there? But there may be a way to, there's room at the front here if people want to come. Well. Oh yeah, there's a couple seats right in there, or one seat. And there's one up here. Oh, and there's one over there. Oh, and there's one more here. And the floor is very still. <laughs> to see a slide, you probably fall off. Yes, yeah, true. There's one more seat right here. Yeah. All right. Okay, so Perry Anderson. In his book, Considerations on Western Marxism, he distinguished between classical Marxism and Western Marxism. Classical Marxism was the Marxism of Marx, Engels, Luxembourg, Kautsky, uh, and of course, Trotsky, Bukharin, and Lenin. And what he argued is that Western Marxism, the Marxism of the Frankfurt School, the Marxism of Lukács and Gramsci, of Korsch, of Marcuse, of Adorno, of Horkheimer, that this Western Marxism was in some way a deviation from true Marxism. It was the Marxism that reflected the defeat of the working class after World War I. It was a Marxism that retreated into the academy. It was a Marxism that retreated from political economy to philosophy. It retreated from materialism to idealism. And it forgot the unity of theory and practice. And writing in 1976, anticipating perhaps a resurgence of the working class in Europe, he argued that we must return to Trotsky and Lenin. Hmm. So, it is interesting that this book made no reference to Marxism 
outside Europe and in particular made no reference to the Marxism of Africa and of India and of Latin America. It is interesting that this book was written in 1976. 1976, Soweto, but also uh, before Soweto, which was in June, I think, of 1976, there was the trial in which Steve Biko presented his defense of the organization Sasso in particular that were on trial, in which he publicly represented the ideas of the black consciousness movement. And these moments of thinking about the ways in which there might be insurgency in South Africa were complemented also by the strikes, the, the 1974 strikes in Durban that began together with Soweto, together with the Black Consciousness Movement, set in place the movement that eventually saw the end of apartheid. This 1976 in South Africa, we might say, was a bringing together, a coming together of theory and practice, the very thing that Perry Anderson was seeking. So, what I want to do in this talk is actually begin to reflect upon the possibility of a Southern Marxism. And I want to do this using the ideas of Franz Fanon. Now I realize that this is a risky endeavor in South Africa. I probably don't fully realize quite how risky it is, otherwise I probably wouldn't be doing it. Franz Fanon is the terrain of intense struggle here and elsewhere. But I will move and try and show, my point here is to show how in fact, how closely Fanon's writings are to the Marxist tradition, that he in fact represents a pillar in that Marxist tradition. Now, let me say first that Anderson does recognize there are different Marxisms, and that's pretty good. There are some people who think there's just one Marxism, a, bibli a biblical Marxism. Anderson recognizes that Marxism varies historically and geographically. Very good. But the trouble is he's only got two. Only two types. And he puts them in a watertight relationship, the one to the other. There's the true, genuine, classical Marxism, and then there's the Western Marxism, which he disparages, and the first one he celebrates. Now what I want to do is to, today, to, as I say, bring together Marx, Gramsci, and Fanon as representing a part of a multiply a multiplex global Marxism. This link that I'm going to make between Gramsci and Fanon has obsessed me for many years. I find an extraordinary link as I will try and show you. It seems as though Fanon has read Gramsci but there is no indication that he ever did read Gramsci. Fanon brings to life Gramsci in Africa, particularly post-colonial Africa. I am not the only person who has seen such a linkage. Seki Otu and Gillian Hart, to name two, have also seen a convergence between Gramsci and Fanon. But it is of a more general philosophical, perhaps methodological character, not the political economic analysis that I'm going to offer you today. And in the end of this talk, when I've tried to show you the link between Marx, Gramsci and Fanon, I will talk about Fanon, or bringing Fanon to South Africa, and I will think about Southern Marxism by reflecting upon Marxism in South Africa. So, that's the agenda, and I've got a few slides for you. I like to draw pictures. Uh, they're not as beautiful as the pictures I draw on the board, but the best I can do with PowerPoint. 
So my first slide is the, oops, I can't even see this, okay. Um, first, all right, as I, as I saw an introduction, let me say this. This, this Marxism as a, having global scope, what I want to insist is that we have to see different Marxisms geographically and historically as being connected and in conversation with one another, first. Second, that Marxisms actually travel. They travel around the world and get reinterpreted. An idea, of course, that Edward Said, now he wasn't specifically talking about Marxism, but the idea of traveling theory and how theory gets reinterpreted how Western Marxism actually travels to different places. And the third point I want to insist upon is that Marxisms developed in one place often are generalized, universalized, and that is when they often become problematic. And part of the task is to actually show that actually, for example, Lenin's ideas were very specific to Russia, even though he presented them as universal. The task is to figure out what is universal and what is particular about Lenin, about Gramsci, about Fanon. So we have to recognize the dangers of false universalization. And that, of course, is where we enter the conception of Eurocentrism the false universalization of ideas that develop in Germany, in France, or wherever. Anyway, that is the idea of having a living tradition. I conceive of a living tradition of Marxism as a tree. And a tree has roots, and that is where I begin. If there are multiple Marxisms, then we have to also ask, what is it that they all share? What is it that they, uh, makes them Marxist? And I would suggest, well, I've got four roots here. A vision of human nature, that is the potentiality of human beings to develop their rich and varied abilities, made possible only under a society called communism. Second, an idea of methodology, which is developed in the thesis on Feuerbach, that as theorists, Marxists are part of the world that they study. Remember the 11th thesis on Feuerbach? Philosophers have studied the world, we must change it. The point of that thesis, there are many points, but one point is that we are part of the world that we engage. And third, we have to have a notion of the premises of history, as elaborated in the German ideology, the four premises of history, and essentially that human beings are producers, they produce the means of their existence, that they procreate, that they then one need leads to another need, and the fourth premise is that as they do all these things, they enter social relations. Marx presents this as just obvious foundational part of his vision um, of, in the end, capitalism. And the fourth, the fourth, the fourth route I'm going to propose here is the preface to the contribution to critique of political economy, which is where he lays out in two pages the summary, his own summary of his own ideas, namely the theory, quote, of historical materialism. And I will ref that will be my point of departure today. So there are the roots. These roots, like any tree, these roots change over time. They intersect in different ways. And as we'll see, different parts of this tree will draw on different uh, aspects and, and rebalance, <laughs> re-equilibrate the relationship among these roots. Second, <coughs> see how beautiful my picture is? <laughs> that is the tree trunk. And that tree trunk, for me, is the three volumes of Capital, the theory of the rise and fall of capitalism. That is the central pillar, you might say, the trunk of the Marxist tradition. And it is a theory of capitalism. He did not have a theory of any other mode of production, in my view. But this is very powerful, and there have been many, many criticisms of it, but it still stands erect as a trunk. 
But out of this trunk, there are little, I don't know what, this sort of, what can I call them, little shrubs. That I, that, that I, that I present as, as Marx, uh, particularly Marx, Marx and Engels' writings on politics, which of course are of very great importance, but don't in any way, in my view, sort of measure up to the central trunk, namely the theory of the rise and fall of capitalism. Now, we have branches, German Marxism, yes, and each of these branches engages with the writings of Marx and Engels, but in a new context, the German context, for example, being one in which the crises of capitalism do not seem to be leading to some final catastrophe. The labor movement is becoming more reformist, as is the Social Democratic Party. And so the Marxists get together and start arguing bitterly about the significance of this particular moment and place in history. Luxembourg and Kautsky, and I include Bernstein, if you will forgive me, engage in a very interesting debate. And responding to the German Marxism and the writings of Marx and Engels, we have Russian Marxism. And that's Trotsky, Bukharin, Lenin, and you know what happens to Russian Marxism? Well, sad to say, it becomes a ruling ideology. And when Marxism becomes a ruling ideology, it decays. It becomes rigid. It does not actually develop. Soviet Marxism has real problems in actually developing and contributing to Marxism. It becomes a decaying branch, degenerate, or well, perhaps in the like a touch, you know, a regressive research program. But anyway, so that's it. So that's then we have Western Marxism, which is a response to is a response to Russian Marxism and particularly also Soviet Marxism. It's a response to the failure of revolution in the West and its <coughs> success quote in the East. The fact that there was a revolution in a relatively backward country, largely agrarian, was not what Marx and Engels and the German Marxists anticipated, and therefore the Russian Marxists had to generate a very distinctive and original theory. I believe that. Um, but the Western Marxists had to respond also. Why no revolution in the West? And the Rev and the Marxism that emerges is precisely how to understand the durability of capitalism and the failure of the working class to develop its revolutionary potential. And in the Western Marxists, we have the people I named before, the Frankfurt School, Horkheimer, Adorno, and Marcuse. We have people like Lukács. Gramsci is ambiguously placed in the Western Marxist tradition. Um, by, by, uh, by Perry Anderson, but in my view firmly, firmly rests in that Western Marxist tradition, perhaps, in my view, the greatest of the Western Marxists, and perhaps the one Marxist that travels perhaps the furthest. And then finally, in this response, I used to call it Third World Marxism, but I'm moving with the times. I now call it Southern Marxism. Um, <laughs> And of course, I associate that with the writings of Mao, but particularly Fanon. And Southern Marxism has to respond to the particular situation of, indeed, the global south and its place economically in the global capitalist system. And what does Marxism mean in that context? In the old days, I used to have something at the top of the tree called sociological Marxism, but I decided to drop that for now. So this is my tree, and what I want to suggest is that each of these branches is, in a sense, responding to in conversation with the other branches. And that the vitality of each branch is actually the result of its conversation with the other branches, its connection with the other branches, its engagement with the other branches, and that this conversation, this combat, has global scope. And that if one of the branches becomes severed from the tree, it cannot survive. Its survival is 
ultimately dependent on its connection to this tradition. Okay, now, the talk. That is the background, and I've been talking about these different Marxisms um, in the seminars uh, of the previous three days. Now, um, so what I said, I'm going to today talk about Marx, Gramsci, and Fanon, and, um, and I will end by talking a little bit about South Africa. So what I want to talk first about is Marx, and I'm going to take those two pages in the Press of Contribution to the Economy, and I'm happy to debate and discuss with you. I brought my Marx along one with me, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading it out because I've only got a few minutes. Um, so what I'm going to do is my view of uh, this, of historical materialism. And I have think it comes in two parts. The first part is the dynamics. And what Marx says is that what happens in history is a succession of modes of production, tribal, ancient, feudal, capitalist, each mode of production can be understood, is understood as the relationship between the forces of production, that is our capacity to transform nature on the one side, and the relations of production, that is the way we classes relate to one another, the way surplus is appropriated by one group from another group. It happens differently under tribalism, where Engels argues the family is the heart, the latent slavery in the family is the heart of the class character of tribal mode of production. Ancient mode of production is the slave mode of production in the Greek, Roman city-states, the feudal mode of production. We have lords and serfs and capitalism, capitalism wage laborers. And the idea is that in the beginning, the forces of production develop under the relations of production, then they're fettered by the relations of production, then there's an epoch of revolution, and then the next, in this sequence, the next relations of production, the next mode of production emerges, the same thing happens again, forces of production increase, fettered, revolution, and so on. And of course, actually, this is a mythical story. He has no evidence for this at all. The only evidence he has Ah, good. The only real study he makes is of the capitalist mode of production. And here he says that the forces of production in the beginning develop as a result of competition among capitalists, crises of overproduction develop, and then the forces of production ultimately uh, de uh, are fettered, and then you have this moment of revolution, and then, well, Bob's your uncle, you get communism. <laughs> And he only has a theory, really, of capitalist mode of production. And he projects back that theory into history to give some semblance of credibility to the idea of the inevitability of communism. That's my interpretation, anyhow. I'm not so interested in this part of the preface. I'm more interested in trying to understand under what conditions a revolution will occur, according to Marx, in capitalism. And this is the second part, the second part that is intermingled with the first part of, the, of this theory, two-page theory of historical materialism. So what Marx argues here is that there is, and he's really talking about capitalism, I believe, there is a base, an economic base, a mode of production, which involves forces of production and relations of production, and it is, supports a superstructure, which he throws out a few words, including the legal, uh, philosophical, religious, uh, political institutions. He puts them all together in the superstructure, which is like a roof, which in a sense, you might say, in one way, protects and reproduces the base. Now, what does he say? He says also that there is a, there is, the, the base generates working class solidarity through the formation of a working class consciousness. And he says that there is a determinate or sometimes conditional 
social consciousness that emerges by virtue of workers participating in production, but fascinatingly enough says, on the other hand, the superstructure is also shaping social consciousness, and so in a sense leaves open the possibility that the superstructure that might generate, for example, consciousnesses of gender, of race, of ethnicity, of nation, they may contest and challenge the emergent class consciousness that comes from the base. In the end, I think he argues that as a result of the development of class struggle, that the social consciousness becomes a class consciousness and the superstructural effects are dissolved. But I think just looking at that preface, there is this possibility that class consciousness does not win out. Okay, that is my, that is my rendition of the historical materialism. And what I want to do now is to show what Gramsci does to the to the idea on the right. But, I've got this, but the balance of forces side of this picture is meant to do, is to, meant to help us explain under what conditions you will get revolution here, under what conditions you will get class consciousness here. And Marx, even in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels said, imply that it's possible that actually there will be no revolution and instead barbarism will emerge. Gramsci adds something very crucial to this picture on the right. He fills this place here with what he calls civil society. That is to say, he, Gramsci, talks about the new period of advanced capitalism in the West as being characterized not by a new form of capitalism, but by a emergent civil society in the last quarter of the 19th century. So let me draw you the picture for Gramsci. It is all about state and civil society. And I should say, well, Gramsci, for those who are not aware of who he is, Gramsci was an Italian Marxist, um, lived in southern Italy, in Sardinia, was born there, won a member of seven. He's one of the few Marxists who come from a very poor area, agrarian area, uh, agrarian you know, almost a, it's a peasant community, uh, though his father was a sort of white-collar worker. Um, he was born a hunchback and suffered throughout his life from many ailments to do with being a hunchback. His mother tried to get to remove the hunchback by hanging him from the rafters of their home. He was a very resolute and determined person and acquired education, largely self-taught, eventually arrived in Turin in 1911 to study at the university. Philology and philosophy didn't get the degree, instead became a journalist, became involved in politics, some of the politics of a socialist character, and after the First World War, uh, yeah, particularly, well, in 1917, when the Russian Revolution occurred, he saw the Russian Revolution as an exemplification of a mythology that will galvanize the working class. He saw Marxism as an ideology, as an ideology that will mobilize people, not a scientific treatise, but an ideology. In fact, he wrote a wonderful uh, again, two pages. This is all the best Marxists write in two page documents. Um, it, was a, it was an article called The Revolution Against Capital. Basically, the, the, the October Revolution was a revolution against the laws, the, the inevitable laws of the sequencing uh, of the succession of modes of production. In a sense, what he was saying, of course, that the Bolsheviks have managed to transcend history, or the history as Marx laid out in the three volumes of Capital. But anyway, that is Gramsci. He, he, he became the editor of L'Ordre Nuovo, a magazine of the working class, which described the occupation of factories in Turin, 1920 to 21, and for the rest of his life was obsessed with the question of why that 
factory socialism in one city did not actually <coughs> lead to a broader revolution. Why was it ultimately defeated? He became a founding member of the Communist Party, initially, then its general secretary, became a parliamentarian, was immune from fascist uh, oppression for the, until 1927, when he was uh, charged with treason and imprisoned for, he was told he was, the, the sentence was for 20 years, he died in 1937. Um, in prison, and he wrote in prison the prison notebooks, which is the greatest, probably, in my view, the greatest contribution to Western Marxism, and indeed one of the major contributions to Marxism as a whole, and probably only wrote those prison notebooks because he was protected by the fascist prison. If he had been out in the open, in exile somewhere, you can be sure that Stalin would have made sure that he would not either not write it or would not survive. Um, and Stalin did have a habit of bumping off people he thought were a challenge to the Marxist lens. So, so what I'm saying here is actually that the prison, in a sense, protected him, allowed Gramsci to elaborate these extraordinary ideas. I should say also that the prison notebooks are rather difficult to read. Some of them are written in elaborate code. Um, uh, so, but, and that makes them very exciting because we can all disagree about what they mean. <laughs> that is what Marxists love to disagree. So anyway, the point is that one of his major ideas, and I'm summarizing Gramsci in one slide, which, I mean, he'll be turning in his grave to see this, but doesn't matter um, for the purposes of this talk, where I'm emphasizing this idea that it is civil society, these institutions, organizations, and movements between state and market that actually capture, that actually capture the distinctiveness of advanced capitalism. <coughs> But not only that, he saw that the modern advanced capitalist state was an expanded state, was not just the coercive apparatuses that Lenin talked about, but included legal apparatuses, welfare apparatuses, educational apparatuses, with which we are all familiar. And he argued that there is, in a sense, the, there's a close connection between civil society and the state. The state sort of sets the framework within which civil society operates. And he said that the actors that enter into civil society, being a Marxist, are different classes or fractions of classes. Now the point of this scheme is to say that, and this is Gramsci talking to Lenin, you might say, that the idea of seizing state power is not a possible way of entering into revolution in the West. That civil society has the capacity to absorb conflict, deflect conflict, and organize people's consent through their participation in civil society. And through, for example, participating in schools, through social mobility, one actually participates in trying to advance one's shall we say, one's career. These are the sorts of institutions that actually deflect from and undermine the possibilities of class solidarity. But, he says, uh, given that civil society is also the terrain, the terrain on which conflict will occur. Civil society is not just a way of organizing consent, it is also the terrain, the necessary terrain for organizing opposition, opposition to, challenging to, capitalism. And he talked about the war of position. That is the conquest, the slow, patient conquest of the institutions of civil society. Not attacking the state, but trying to secure <coughs> control over civil society with the help of what? The modern prince, which for Gramsci is the Communist Party, which is a party that is very much attentive and accountable to the uh, supporters and the party is the agency through which the working class can build alliances in civil society. And finally, he says, once you, once you develop a war of position, Successfully, once you control civil society, then seizing state power is a minor matter. The personnel of the state have already 
had their confidence in the state eroded, and the war of movements is a final, um, not too significant uh, movement. The most significant part of the struggle is the war of position. So that is the idea, the centrality of civil society, and a war of position. You might even say that what happened in the 1980s in South Africa was a war of position. Hmm. And here, hegemony is force and consent. Hegemony is the concept that we associate with Gramsci. And here, the idea is hegemony is the combination of force and consent. That consent is, in a sense, protected by force. We stop at a red light. We consent to doing so, but at the back of our minds, or knowing that there is force behind that consent. And what Gramsci argues is that what is so unique to advanced capitalism is not the securing of people's participation through repression, but through the organization of consent, and consent backed up by force, and that, that force is itself the object of consent. We apply force to strikes with the consent of the people. So that is his idea of hegemony, his first idea. There is a second idea of hegemony, the idea of class domination. This idea is that the dominant class presents its ideas, its interests, as the interests of all. The capitalists are trying to coordinate their interests with those of the subordinate classes. So what's good, as they used to say in the United States no longer, what's good for General Motors is good for everybody. I guess they now say Walmart. I don't know. Um, so, hegemony as a form of class domination. And here he now talks about the struggle for hegemony. That is what happens under advanced capitalism. Namely, that the working class seeks to organize its hegemony and challenges the hegemony of the capitalist class. And he formulates this as follows. He says the struggle for hegemony is on the one hand bounded by military, by military forces. There is a limit to what you can do given the military balance of forces. And he saw those in both technical and subjective terms. But, okay, I guess I put them in the wrong order. But second, the terrain, the terrain of struggle is what he calls the political terrain of struggle. And here he talks about the development of classes. And he had three stages of classes. One is the economic corporate, the sectional trade union. As, as a, whoa, that's, that's how much I've had. <laughs> so I've got 15 minutes, right? All right, we'll do it. All right, economic corporate. Then the next is economic class, which is the whole class's interest. In the case of the working class, it's interest in wages, in minimum wage legislation, in um, and welfare. And finally, what he calls a political level, political class, hegemonic class, in which the class presents its interest as the interest of all. And that, of course, requires concessions to the working class. The question is, how does the working class build hegemony? It is not altogether clear what it has is its modern prince, the Communist Party, but it's difficult for it to make economic concessions. It's very difficult for the working class to organize its hegemony, and the economic context really sets the frame within which these, this struggle for hegemony at political level takes place. That, in brief, is Gramsci. Um, and this has, as I say, this notion of hegemony, characteristic of advanced capitalism, has these two moments. So, what I want to do now is move on to Fanon. And I'm not going to do justice to him, but you'll get the idea, I promise. And I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and I'm going to take basically the wretched of the earth, now, Fanon, I'm not going to give you a biographical sketch because I don't have the time. Um, but Fanon, um, yes, 
Fanon, of course, was living in Algeria, and what he, his understanding of colonialism and post-colonialism was, in fact, very much shaped by French settler colonialism. And this is how he conceived of the colonial situation in very Gramscian terms. So first he distinguished between colonizers and colonized. And there we have the colonial state, which should have a metropolitan appendage, France, and the settler farmers that were, of course, the adjunct of the colonial state. So the peculiar form of colonialism, settler colonialism. Now, Fanon was very interested in the class structure of the colonized. So on the one side, he talked about an urban bloc, a national bourgeoisie composed of perhaps a few lawyers, teachers, civil servants, some petty bourgeoisie, commercial bourgeoisie under colonialism, supported by a labor aristocracy. He referred to the labor aristocracy as parasitical, as a parasitical group. Um, he saw that the labor aristocracy was very much allied with the national bourgeoisie and both did not have an interest in the transformation of class structure but in the replacement of white by black, a succession. Now, on the rural bloc we have the traditional leaders who were a screen that existed on behalf of the colonial state and what for Fanon was a volcanic peasantry that had been dispossessed of access to its means of existence, land. That is a rural block. Now, he also had other classes, you might say intermediary classes. On the one hand, he talked about the intellectuals that had, in the post-colonial period, been exiled from the city, moving into the rural areas and becoming the organizers of the peasantry, the radical intellectuals, organic intellectuals in the Gramscian word, the use of the Gramscian idea. And then he also talked about the lump and proletariat that because it was rootless could move in different directions with different alliances. What Panam was saying is that there is on the one hand a war of movement, which has to be violent, he argues, against settler colonialism, but at the same time, simultaneously, and this is not so central to Gramsci, where he saw there's a sequence between war of movement, war of position, simultaneously there is a war of position. And this war of position is a struggle for hegemony. It's a struggle for hegemony between two roads from the colony to the post-colony, the national bourgeois road and the national liberation struggle. The national bourgeois road is centered in the national bourgeoisie, which seeks to, in a sense, replace the colonialists and has the ally of the labor aristocracy on the one side. And then there is the alternative road, the, which is the one that is centered on the peasantry, organized by radical intellectuals, um, that appeals to traditional leaders and the lumpen proletariat. It's not always clear which way the lump of proletariat and the traditional leaders will go. This is, a, this is an effect of struggle. This is a very Gramscian picture. This is giving life to Gramsci in the context of, in this case, Algeria. Now let me say what he says about these two roads. The national bourgeois road, the idea of succession, well here he says, and I'm going to read to you, um, though I would love to, national bourgeoisie cannot sustain hegemony cannot be representative of all because it doesn't have the economic foundations, the capacity to make concessions. And so he says, because there is not a sufficiently developed economy, there cannot be an inventive, an inventive bourgeoisie, and this bourgeoisie may well start with parliamentary democracy, a rudimentary hegemony, but this over time degenerates. So you get multi parties in the beginning, then you get a one-party state, and then you get a dictatorship. This is what he argues. 
And racism can, in the end, become part and parcel of that. Though his racism is more of a xenophobic character, not vis-a-vis -vis necessarily whites. And the real problem for this national bourgeoisie is that it turns out to be an appendage of international capital. And if you're taking notes, these are the page numbers. So, the other, the other road is the national liberation struggle involves transformation of the social structure, the movement towards a socialist uh, endpoint. And here we have indeed the peasantry plus the exiled intellectuals forging the, 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 the core uh, of this project. And he talks very much about a great deal, like Gramsci, about the political party. And he's very explicit about how the party must be accountable to the members, to society. He talks in great, uh, with great eloquence about participatory democracy um, and how people have to be brought into nation building and how the importance of education, all very Gramscian ideas very Gramscian ideas um, about socialism and the struggle for socialism. So those are the two roads, the two Fanonite roads. Now, Gramsci will go on to talk about, uh, well, yes, I, could, I should talk a little bit. One of the interesting questions is what is the relationship between these two roads? I present it as they're coexisting and simultaneously competing with one another. It is possible, if you, in places in Fanon's writings, that actually the, the national bourgeois world begins and then there is a national liberation struggle. But it's not very clear. And this, of course, is of crucial importance uh, in the context of South Africa. What is the relationship between these two struggles? To what extent do they coexist, and to what extent do they succeed one another? Right, so Gramsci would also talk about the limits of the possibility of a socialist project, and Fanon does too, and he argues rather optimistically that the West is in some way going to be dependent upon Africa for markets, that it might, if it might even be persuaded to give reparations, um, and then in the end he says, well, Perhaps this will not happen unless the working class, he says, and they must wake up and stop behaving like a sleeping beauty. Uh, uh, so, of course, again, there is this sort of reliance, as in the case of the Bolsheviks, on some sort of revolution happening in the West. In the end, his analysis of economic limits, of which we are now only too aware, um, are not really well developed. And he argues also the military limits. Well, he argues that imperialism or imperial economies don't like violence, and so the socialist project will be able to succeed. This is by far the weakest part of his argument, and it is not surprising that this, the idea of a national liberation struggle has really not been realized anywhere in Africa. Um, so, but nevertheless, it is important as an idea that shapes the way we understand what is going on. So, Fanon in South Africa, how much time have I got? <laughs> so I've got eight minutes. Good. That's great news, actually. The less I say, the better. Um, oh, now that's generosity. <laughs> what do I have to pay for that? All right, I must start with no chatting. Southern Marxism, okay. All right, Fanon in South Africa. Look, there are real limits of Fanon's analysis. He's dealing with Algeria, ultimately. He universalizes that, but it's Algeria. Settler colonialism based on an agrarian, agrarian economy. What we have to do is, to, when we bring Fanon to South Africa, we have to do a class analysis. We have to ask, what is the character of the national bourgeoisie here in South Africa? South Africa has, of course, a much more developed economy than Algeria, industrially based, and the question is, could in fact the national bourgeoisie constitute a hegemony in South Africa, something that Fanon's claiming is not possible in his analysis of Africa. One has to look not as the labor, the working class as a labor aristocracy, but one has to talk also about, yes, the class struggles the, over the century or century and a half of 
South African history, we have seen struggles, either working class, but of a aspirations for an other order. We have to see that in a different light. One has to look at the peasantry in a different light. One has to see how it has been dispossessed in a way very specific to South Africa and whether that means that it is not quite the revolutionary class that uh, Fanon claimed. We have to think about the lumpen proletariat, a bad word, but nevertheless, the idea of those who are semi-employed, unemployed, um, in the peripheries of, of the South African cities, something of which you all know much more about than I. One has to think about chiefs and their role in the post-colonial order and to what extent they become collaborators with the national bourgeoisie. And one has to think about intellectuals too. All this, the Fanonian framework, lends itself to rethinking Fanon as well as South Africa. And we have to think about race. I think in some ways, paradoxically, this is Fanon's blind spot. He does not think about in the analysis of the wretched of the earth too seriously about the continuing presence of white domino, of, of on the one hand, white bourgeoisie, um, white professional class, white working class, poor whites. This is, doesn't enter into his analysis. And it's a question of whether one should go back to his earlier work, Black Skin, White Masks, to understand race. Very paradoxical that we would have to deal, we have to reinterpret Fanon to sit the situation here. And of course, we have to think about the relationship between the NDR, as it's called, and socialism. But I prefer to use the Fanonian vocabulary of the national bourgeois road and the national liberation struggle. What is the relationship between the two? OK. Now, I've got three minutes. Four minutes. Right, now let me, all right. Right, let me say something about Southern Marxism since that was the title of the talk. Look, I think in South Africa you have an articulation of multiple Marxisms. You have a Marxism-Leninism that is not simply an epiphenomenon of the common turn from Moscow. That it was that because the Communist Party became so significant in this country, it's because it was able to adapt to local circumstances. So there is an interesting, there has been an interesting <coughs> Marxism influenced by Leninism. I think Jack's, Jack and Ray Simon's book, Color and Class, is an example of a very fruitful, classic understanding of Marxist history, of uh, South African history from that sort of view. Then there are the French structuralists, the, 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 the research tradition that really began with Harold Wolpe and included those uh, young, white, exiled Marxists in England. People like David Kaplan and Mike Morris. I don't know if people read these people anymore. But they, as, as Andrew Nash has pointed out, have somewhat disappeared from the scene. Their Marxism was an attempt to understand the peculiarity of South African apartheid by looking at it as an articulation of modes of production and the way the state reproduced that. That is a very interesting Western Marxism, you might say, that travels to South Africa. There is an indigenous Western Marxism, you might say, or influenced by Western Marxism that associated with Richard Turner the more democratic participatory vision of socialism that was carried forward by Eddie Webster, amongst others, and the formation of SWAP. SWAP has been, in a sense, another form of Marxism very much centered on the specificity of labor struggles in South Africa. There's Gramscian analyses, but people like um, Murray and Satgar and Gillian Hart have used to understand the peculiarities of the situation we now find ourselves in, the use of a concept called passive revolution, which is analogous to, analogous, only analogous to the national bourgeois road um, as described by Fanon. Yes. And then there is Fanonian Marxism. And of course, Fanon himself is a terrain of struggle. Um, and we have, of course, very leading figures, at, uh, Mbembe, um, we have Steve Biko, and Steve Biko was actually himself very influenced by or read, engaged with these various Marxisms himself. 
So the question is, all right, can Fanon also travel? Can there be a Fanonian Marxism in South Africa? Well, we know there was a Fanon traveled, Fanon traveled to the United States, the Black Panthers, Stokely Carmichael, even Malcolm X. He traveled to the United States. He travels through Africa. But the weird thing is, and perhaps Dillip will say something about this, um, <coughs> does he travel elsewhere in the South? One of the weird things about our subaltern studies is that of India, that though they're talking about peasant insurgency, no reference to Fanon, Guha, Chatterjee. Who does he refer to? Gramsci. No, never Fanon. So very interesting. That, why doesn't Fanon travel to India, for example? Yes, 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 yes. And I think Fanon raises one last question. Perhaps we can talk about Fanon as the global Marxist today, in as much as his vision of the labor aristocracy perhaps is not totally at odds with the idea of a, a, a contracting organized labor that is very, in a very defensive position across the globe, and the rise of a increasingly dispossessed populations. And as they say sometimes, some people say that now, now the, the North is following the South, and that the experiences of the South, peculiar though they are, are now in a sense becoming slowly but surely the experiences of the North. And Fanon and his idea of the revolution of the dispossessed becomes more generalized across the globe. And what Fanon is doing, and here is a real, real difference from Marx, Marx thought that the revolution will be made by those who are incorporated and exploited. Whereas Fanon says that the revolution is going to be made by the excluded, the marginalized. And that is a very different vision of revolution. And therefore, I think Fanon has to be taken very seriously at a global level. And I've got one paragraph to read as my conclusion. <coughs> right. I thought I'd better get it straight, what I'm trying to say. I never read things out, but I must read this paragraph. South Africa has been an epicenter of a complex of original Marxisms that together we might call a Southern Marxism. Part of that originality comes from South African soil. Part comes from an engagement with different traditions from abroad as they are localized in South Africa. And part comes from the collision and combat among Marxisms and between Marxism and non-Marxist traditions within South Africa. I'm not here to favor one Marxism or another, but to defend a living Marxist tradition in its multiple manifestations, in all its complex intersections, interconnections, and interactions across the globe. A Marxism that cuts itself off from the Marxist tree is heading for decay, sterility, and irrelevance. We definitely need the tree to grow, to sprout new branches. If Marxism is to have any hope of saving the world from capitalism, and we need something to save the world from capitalism, I don't know of an, another tradition that has so systematically contested capitalism in all its multiple expressions. Thank you. For a few years, uh, while I was a student in Calcutta, I was admitted in a Pentecostal school. And uh, we used to have a charismatic preacher. And every Friday, the school was treated to some entertainment where they bring in an unbeliever. And the unbeliever was usually characterized by the fact that he occupied the podium, right? didn't move around very much. He took over the role of the preacher. And he also wore his cap in church. So, uh, I thought that's probably one way to begin, since there were some speculations as to where I stood on the question of Marxism. <laughs> and uh, 
when uh, Michel asked me to initially respond to uh, um, Michael, uh, I thought I would have more time and that I would actually be able to speak about Marxist thinkers from the Global South, whom I'm reading now, like people like Enrique Dussel, the Caribbean Marxists, Indian Marxists like Kalyan Sen, Jairus Banaji, the younger Chinese Marxists like Pan Sin Chen, the extremely rigorous uh, Taiwanese scholar, and of course, Kojin Karatani, who's also now rewriting a lot of Marxism through Kant. But what I'll do here is uh, actually a 10-minute response that takes off from the end of uh, uh, Michael's paper and the question of why subaltern studies didn't uh, address for now, and ask the question, is Southern Marxism what is necessary? Is that what is necessary? Right? Not, is Southern Marxism necessary? Is Southern Marxism what is necessary? So the first, uh, there are four, four parts to this. The first is to think about subaltern studies and its limits, and subaltern studies was, in some sense, and considered an expression of Southern Marxism. And when Michael asked the question in his paper, which I had the privilege to read, can we say that subaltern studies is a kind of Marxism? And he says the answer is no. And I would completely agree with him. And a new generation in India, like myself, has had to engage with the legacy of its putative radicalism, just as a new generation of South Africans have to engage with the legacies of a local Marxism, inflected by a variety of Marxism and Leninism, which have been fairly damaging. There has been an occlusion of Fanon in subaltern studies, but also Stuart Hall, and the African-American experience. So the question in subaltern studies is why did they not take race seriously? They, did, they didn't take a lot of categories seriously. It's not only race, they didn't take caste seriously, they didn't take gender seriously. So in the end, as they ran into volume after volume, volume 12 put together race, caste, gender, and so on. So they felt that it had to be done, so volume 12 dealt with that. Not satisfactory, but it dealt with that. But the question of race and black intellection, and certainly more of subaltern intellection, was never taken seriously. Subaltern studies was a very elitist enterprise in what it studied and what it dealt with. There was very little about the conceptual world of the subaltern. <coughs> Ranajit Guha was very dismissive of the folk, and his readings of tribal forms recuperate only rebellion, and that too through a reading of the colonial archive against the grain. He was not very interested in reading the products of the subaltern mind. They were read through the, uh, through the colonial archive. And we have multiple instances of this in Partha Chatterjee's work and Dipesh Chakravarti's work, where they depend a lot on elite discourse. They don't theorize from it. A lot of elite discourse in India is seen as the material. The theory comes from elsewhere. So it was very much about a placement within a European discourse, drawing upon Southern material. It was not a Southern Marxism. It was a Southern history written with Western theory. Arguably, even the engagement with Gramsci is functional and simplistic at best, as Jill Hart has recently pointed out in a fine article in the Economic and Political Weekly. Again, Vivek Chibber has called out the Hegelianism of the subaltern school, which they haven't responded to, uh, in its imagination of ideal categories and the presumed historical trajectories of Europe. So Europe is presumed to have gone through certain ideal trajectories, and the question is, why in India have we not managed to do this? But here, then, the second part, I really want to talk about having come out of the subaltern studies and, in some sense, dissolution with that experience of that engagement with a Western theory which was used to rewrite our historical experience. I'm not writing something on Fanon because, uh, as they say, you know, when the heat goes up, you put the fan on. Right? So, <laughs> Fanon is the, uh, is the flavor of the month in South Africa. So I started reading Fanon, and one of the uh, and this is uh, uh, some these are some initial formulations of my own relation to Fanon's work. If you think about it, spontaneity and organization are the twin, twin themes of Fanon. He recognizes the presence of an already existing anti-colonial culture, but it's the attribution of that. And here again, I think he shares a lot with subaltern studies in not being able to take subaltern intellection very seriously. It's about an action that's taken seriously. So he attributes this anti-colonial culture to a kind of noble savage culture that the peasants defend their tradition stubbornly, as it were. And I quote from The Wretched of the Earth. I shan't put up the page numbers as Michael did. I suggest you go back. He, uh, he says the peasants are comparable to hordes of rats moved by the primordial spirits of their environment, the bush, the jungle, the desert. 
Algerians are ultimately, this is from page 130, and I quote, the pimps, hooligans, the unemployed, and the petty criminals who throw themselves into the struggle, but they have to be urged from behind. So there is a sense of the spontaneity of the masses, but they need organization. The organization can't come from them. The organization has to come from elsewhere. So that is the dialectic of spontaneity and organization for now. But what is more interesting for me is that for a person writing about Algeria, what one misses in Fanon is Islam. Right? And this tradition, and Islam's tradition of resistance, which goes back to the late 18th century against the Ottomans and then against the French. From 1832 to 1848, Emir Abd al-Qadir confined the French to the coast, and throughout the 19th century, in North, East, and West Africa, Sufi brotherhoods and sheikhs led rebellions. These were not illiterate peasants. Remember, in the 1830s, the rate of illiteracy in Algeria was much lower than that of France. This is something to remember. So here again, you find these contradictions in Fanon, which we need to take seriously. So while he edited El Mujahid, Right? As you all know, the word Mujahid is again a very strongly Islamic word. We are very familiar with it now through these notions of jihad and so on. So where, while he was editing El Mujahid, Fanon in conversation with Ali Shariati, who then went on to play a prominent role in the Iranian revolution, encouraged him to exploit the resources of Islam. However, he did not call the anti-colonial culture present in Algeria a Muslim culture. Right? It was very clear that what Fanon recognized as spontaneity came from centuries of an already existing Islamic tradition of rebellion. Now, what happens when we recover Fanon is that the study of Fanon's text continues to happen in the abstract, with no real reference to the social, political, and religious context of Algeria. If we read Fanon, we have to read Algerian history, we have to read Al religion in Algeria. So a disembedded Fanon, such as we begin to use, as it were, because it's a very instrumental reading of Fanon that we engage in, a disembedded Fanon is useful for the universalization of Western theory yet again. So Fanon becomes an example of Southern Marxism, right? which I'm not very clear about, but that is an initial uh, formulation. <coughs> so the third part of the uh, response, what would it mean to have a conceptual vocabulary from the South and address the question of language. Now, one of the things that happens when we do theory, as it were, in our spaces, there is the question of translation. And with the current <coughs> postmodern dispensation that we are in, we celebrate hybridity, we celebrate circulation, metissage, pluralization, and one could go on, multiple words. But we do not deal with the question of what cannot be translated from our spaces. There is something about the imminent, the particular, the politics of untranslatability, as Emily Apter has called it, drawing upon Barbara Cassin's work. The question of quiddity, right? that which is irreducible, that which is not translatable, how do we deal with that in our societies? Our societies are particular, as well in many ways. They're not merely translatable in terms of a theory that comes from elsewhere. This works both ways, because when you think about universalism, universalism, the idea of universalism is merely a nativism plus power. It's like Heidegger said, a language is a dialect backed by an army. It's a similar kind of idea. Or to put any another way, any universalism is also a particularism, which is what Wan Hui argued in this very room. Wan Hui, one of the most distinguished Chinese social theorists, argued in this very room. So earlier, we had colonialism as a carapace of the human condition. Now it's capitalism. At one time, everything was colonial. So we have pre-colonial, colonial, post-colonial, post as the world was molded by colonialism. And there was indeed no experience prior to it or beyond it. And we also have the idea now that capitalism is the only condition we have. It's a bit like the Truman Show. There is no outside. You're all within this glass pole. Right? And you might, you might struggle, we remain in it. So. How do we engage with the question of experience, of quiddity, and of language, that we have to develop a new conceptual vocabulary drawn from our traditions of intellection, which may or may not be translatable? And this is an important question to think about, this politics of untranslatability. So the questions that arise from this is, what if Fanon had known Arabic? 
And here, I mean, as you can understand, I'm a sympathetic reader of Fanon. These are questions that I'm raising. These are not intended to diss him as it were. What if Fanon had known Arabic? What if our Marxists knew Zulu, Sutu, Pedi, Swana, or indeed the languages of the areas that they study? Would they find it as easy to make mere exemplars of India, Africa, Latin America, vast swathes of territory reduced to conceptual clarity? What is the price that we pay for this clarity? That's a question we need to ask. Gramsci, in his discussion on the Southern question, subaltern studies did for us in India is that we all read Gramsci, I was telling Michael this. Uh, Gramsci, in his discussion on the Southern question, ironically observes that Benedetto Croce from the South, as you know in Gramsci there's a distinction between the North and the South, the Industrial North, the Agrarian South, and the multiple entailments of the South being agrarian, he ironically observed that Benedetto Croce, a leading intellectual from the South, performed a very important national function, he was being ironical here, by, and I quote, having detached radical intellectuals from the South from the peasant masses and having them participate in European culture. And that is precisely our dilemma. The dilemma of theory from the global South is precisely this, this desire, this fascination, this pleading to be let into the portals of something called Western culture, that what we write is translatable. What we write can be translated in the theory that comes from elsewhere. That there is no quiddity, there is no particularity. There is only a historical experience which, which is uh, characterized by an utter clarity. Right? So this is the quandary of theorizing from our spaces. So the question really would be, what would doing theory from the global south involve? It's not about southern Marxism. What indeed is the theory that we have to generate from our spaces? And I'm not sure what the answer is. And that is really what my quest is. Finally, I'll end with two quotes. How much time do I have? Three minutes. Uh, you know, in India, I'm used to speaking ex tempo for two hours. So when she said I have 10 minutes, I actually wrote it down so that I'll stick to time. So two quotes. Um, the first is from a quote you might be familiar with. The Vera Zarsilich writes to Marx in 1881 on the peasant commune. Would it develop in a socialist direction or would it perish? And then you have the series of uh, discussions that Marx then has, which are available in Theodore Shannon's book with critical essays. But in this uh, positioning, what is the positioning of Vera Zarsilich in, in relation to Marx? It is the writing back to a theory. It's a going back to Marx. It's actually, you find this coming up very often in conversation. We need to go back to Marx. We need to go back to Kant. We need to go back to Hegel. It's not a going back. It's a staying with. We continue to stay with these thinkers, regardless of the fact that there is an entire world to be discovered within our conceptual vocabularies, within our languages, where we study theory, not in our languages, not derived from our linguistic concepts, but derived from a conceptual vocabulary that comes to us from elsewhere, and colonialism had a part to play in it. So this going back to Marx is part lethargy, part sentimentality, and part merely theology. Returning to the church, not wanting to be an apostate, not wanting to wear the cap in church. So Ellen Roy, who is an Indian Marxist, who founded the Communist Party of Mexico, and this is an act of temerity. An Indian travels halfway across the globe, he founds the Communist Party of Mexico. Then he comes back and he founds the Communist Party of India, and he founds it in Tashkent in Central Asia in 1920. And he writes back to Lenin, correcting him on the national and colonial question in 1920. So he was a young man, hot blooded. So when Lenin puts forward his thesis, he says, you're wrong. And Lenin, of course, meets him. And there's the supplementary thesis on the national and colonial question, which emerges from that. At the end of his life, and I'll read you a longish quote from Emin Roy. At the end of his life, he writes, and I quote, when as a schoolboy of 15, I began my political career, which may end in nothing. I wanted to be free. Independence, complete and absolute, is a newfangled idea. The old-fashioned revolutionaries thought in terms of freedom. In those days, we had not read Marx. And then he goes on to say, those who were jailed and went to the gallows, and I quote again, had no proletariat to propel them. 
they were not conscious of the class struggle. I began my political life with that spirit, and I still draw my inspiration rather from that spirit than from the volumes of capital of 300 volumes by Marxists. So it is the temerity, we need the temerity to conceptualize experience and derive the theory from our conceptual categories embodied and embedded in local language, in local history, and local hopes. And let us work towards untranslatability. Let us work towards quiddity and resist the universal for a while. Thank you. So now we have um, about 30 minutes for discussion, debate, questions. Um, I'll take you in, I think, groups of five. And begin, given time, I'm going to ask everybody to keep it short. So please keep your questions and comments to one minute. Um, and if I start moving toward you, it means you're expiring your one minute. OK. Um, who would like to speak? And, and please introduce yourself when you speak as well. Okay, we're one, I'm gonna give you numbers. So remember your number, one, two, three, is that three right now? All right, I'll we'll add on another two if they come up. Okay, did you raise your hand? No, no, okay. One, number one. Thanks, I'm Tim, I'm sort of I just need to ask a question about the logic of regionalizing Marxism into Western, Russian, and South. Because that tend to homogenize the geography. Because if you speak about the South, the South is not one homogeneous. Yes. If you look at the manner in which South Africa's colonialism happened, it's different from any other uh, yes, country, if I would say. If you go to South America, experience colonialism and make difference differently, uh, accumulation by disposition is slightly different. So the capitalism is still a lot different. I mean, a different thing is different than the United States. So I'm asking this with Question on whether the best way to analyze this is not by looking at the tradition. Speak about classical Marxist tradition, speak about Kantian tradition, Babylonian tradition, Maoist, you know, instead of saying this is southern Marx, because it may end up leading to particular conclusions which may actually negate their Marx. I mean, there have been attempts to develop African socialism. Should we think about South African socialism? Because we think about South African markets, political economy, South African socialism. I'm just trying to find the logic and sustain it. Thanks, Thanks Temba. Great. Number two. Uh, Sharon. And, Can you uh, stand up? I think I have a question for Michael. Where is it from? And, uh, and for Dylan. Michael, you started by saying um, you wanted to begin with the inseparability of Western and Southern Marxism as living tradition and all that. And I just wanted to, so at the end, uh, you end with celebrating multi multiple Marxisms and contestation as part of this living tradition, that's great. But, but what about bringing back something about the, what it is that constitutes the relations between uh, Western and Southern Marxism in Fanon, which is the changing nature of global capital? Uh, I mean, that's part of it. Land labor capital relations at a global state uh, scale. As part of what constitutes Southern Marxism. Uh, and for Dillard, uh, you know, I, I just say that uh, the, your, I mean, part of what you said is what is your thing. And uh, the, the thing about subaltern intellection, I mean, it is, a, it is exciting, and yet it flies in the face of uh, Gramscian notion of praxis, where 
intellection and action are inseparable. I mean, I think you're quite right, though, obviously, that the whole history from below stressed so this idea of agency and there's really no attention to the traditions of the oppressed. But that's part of the Gramscian problematic, actually. It's just the Gramscian problematic says it's inseparable. And therefore, the idea of searching for intellectual traditions as separable from action is actually a problem from a Gramscian perspective. Uh, and, and, and just the other point is that and your refrain is what happens to our societies, our traditions, and it's that our that I find very, you know, particularly problematic from a Fanonian perspective. I mean, it, it, how do we know it's not the traditional leader or the national bourgeoisie, but the radical intellectual who's speaking the hour? Great, thanks, Jared. Number three. Right. Um, I'm going to start with the first year student of Brits studying art. Uh, we explored different strands of Marxism, Marxism sorry, interconnected and each having some form of prognosis to neoliberal order. And basically my question is, what sort of Marxism now needs to be developed to deal with the current situation of imperial, imperialism? Great question, thanks. Uh, I'm surprised, Devin, you don't want to ask a question. Number four. Devin? You don't have anything. All right. Anybody else want to ask a question this round? This is unusually quiet for such a large crowd. Michelle? Yeah? Oh, sorry. Yes. Well, round number four. Uh, just very quickly. Introduce sorry. yourself. Introduce so, yourself. Sorry, I'm running cash flow. <laughs> I'm just prompted by that last question in which uh, you raised the issue of imperialism very correctly. And the question to both is, of course, all countries are very distinct. And South Africa to India or China or Britain or Brazil or Algeria, we're all very different. But in this day and age, and in fact foreseen by Lenin particularly, and already Marx in terms of his understanding of global <coughs> capital, is the key question that you refer to facing today the practicalities in response to the American and Western domination of the world and their imperialism, isn't it that common aspect that the majority of people of the world, including people within Britain or America and <coughs> Europe, face against the transnational corporates and their governments. So that is very much a question that Marxism, anti-imperialism needs to resolve in terms of the unification of the diverse people of the world. Thanks, Ronnie. Okay, any last question this round? All right, Michael or Dilip, which who wants to go first? He's, he's studying you, Michael. Do you want to, I think you should stand. Right. You can hear better when we talk on this. So end. I should talk for what, minute or two minutes? Yeah, talk fast. <laughs> <laughs> do, I, do I marry allowed to respond to Dilip? Yes. No. Yes. Okay. Okay. Why don't you give him yes. five minutes? No, no, no. Four minutes. Four minutes. <laughs> you said it. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, to be very, yes, uh, I, I, my formulations were indeed intended to recognize very much the particularity of many of these Marxisms. But I still hold on to the idea that you have to go beyond particularities. And it is the role of intellectuals and others, but intellectuals in particular, to reach beyond particularities. And Gramsci is the prototype, as you were hinting at yourself, who himself, on the one hand, recognized the importance of common sense. And he was, of course, a philologist too who also engaged in this amazing comparative history, comparing countries under different rubrics, which would take me a long time. So I think that, that I think you can, I'm, I, I, I'm with you on the, on the importance of particularity, but we cannot remain particularity. And so the question is whether, where, at what level, where, how does one move beyond particularity? And, and I think you would very agree, how does one do it is, 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 a, is a very big question. Um, Fanon is fascinating, responding to Sharon, it fun is fascinating in that he is continually in the wretched of the earth referring to the West, Western Europe. He's continually making that comparison between the colonial experience as a despotic experience and the Western experience as a hegemonic one. It's as if he had imbibed 
Gramsci's understanding of the West. Um, so he, he is involved in necessarily that comparison, but I agree entirely with Dillard that there is, a, 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 there is an absence of a connection to the common experience, the common sense, whether it be peasants or whether it be, be workers. And he was, he might say, uh, very much engaged with a rhetorical uh, development of concepts that did actually get removed from that experience, which allowed him to become, in a sense, the Bible of revolution, and problematically so, perhaps, too. So it has a plus and a minus. Uh, Marxism now. Well, we could, um, I mean, Ron is perhaps, perhaps the answer is, you know, uh, Marxism is now has to be an imperialism. Perhaps we should build on the shoulders of Lenin's uh, Imperialism, higher stage of capitalism. <laughs> I mean, extraordinarily prophetic in many ways, written whenever it was, 1914 or something, um, who already recognized the importance of finance capital. I myself develop a Marxism that is, it is, that is, is, is a Marxism after Polanyi. I was supposed to give a talk this time about that, but I gave it two years ago. And there, I, the importance today, the Marxism of today seems to me a Marxism that takes very, very seriously the experience of markets. That's what Polanyi does. And I think what we are living in a world in which the Marxist analysis of production is inadequate, necessary, but inadequate, that we have to also look at the experience of markets, of commodification, and Polanyi talked about the commodification of labor, he talked about the commodification of nature, he talked about the commodification of money. That is none other than development of precarious work, the, uh, the ecological crisis that we, we, we face, and the role of finance capital. To that I will add the commodification of knowledge, which refers to the transformation of the very process of producing knowledge in one of its centers, namely universities. So that will be the sort of Marxism that I will develop, um, it is a, an attempt to address the deleterious consequences of the continuing expansion of markets. And, and Kemba's point about regionalization. Ah, yes. Well, I, yes, well, I, it, it, it's, it's, it's the same question, Temba, as the question of particularity. How does one move beyond particularity? And, you know, is, it's an open question. Is there something like the South? Ronnie seems to think there is something like the South, and the presumption of, 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 of this talk is there is something um, that politically, economically, the South shares. Fanon is very weak on that. His, in, his understanding of the global uh, capitalist economy, the global economy, is indeed very weak. Um, and that is necess necessary addition to, to uh, definitely a necessary addition to his, his framework. Um, but actually, I don't know what sort of great theories we have of global capitalism today. And that's a really a great tragedy. And I think that we should, you know, I, I, we have bits and pieces. I mean, one of my favorites is, is Giovanni Origi. Um, uh, but, you know, they're all incomplete. Um, and I think, and somebody was saying that somehow there is, there is something outside capitalism. I think we're all in capitalism. I don't know if there's an outside capitalism. I'm with Rosa Luxemburg here. Capitalism is absorbing us in a very demonstrative power. We need better theories of the processes of accumulation. David Harley's work on accumulation doesn't, doesn't do it. Doesn't do it. So that is, a, that is a very important project that we, I think, all around the world have to face if, we, if this planet is to survive. Four and a half minutes. Perfect. Dylan. I can speak from here, right? Can you hear him? You can hear me at the back? No. No, no I think you can hear me. Thank you for Sorry. Uh, I'll try and take less than four and a half minutes. Uh, yep. See, one of the things about there being no outside to capitalism is that it reminds me of Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them. There's only one thing, you know. So, but that's, a very, that's the Hegelian residue, I would say, of Marxism, that there is one idea that rules at any given time. But that's, uh, we let that be. The two questions that uh, Sharad asked me, one about the relation between local intellectual traditions and, quest, uh, and politics. In my early work, in, when I did my PhD, was to go back. I'm from Kerala, a southwestern state in India, which uh, was the first state anywhere in the world to elect a communist party to power in 1957. Right? So my PhD looked at that. And as I traveled around and interviewed people, I found out that 
Very few of them were actually interested in the text of Marxism. Very few of them actually knew very much about Marxism. There was, of course, a theoretical elite, which, of course, had read a Stalinist version of Marxism. They had not read Marx. They read the history, the, CPA, the history of the CPSUB, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Bolshevik, which was the standard text at that time. So what I found is a multiplicity of practices where the Marxists and the communists were engaging with religion, folk religion. They were taking part in spirit possession cults. They were doing multiple things where they were actually rooted in the particular. And they realized that this could not be translated into Marxism. So that's a short answer. The second question of what is the hour? How do we know our, uh, that uh, if we say our traditions and so on, how do we know that this is not the traditions of the elite and of the uh, conservative that we represent? That's fairly easy because any tradition is characterized by contention. Right? And that is one of the uh, features of tradition, I mean, unless, of course, you're talking about the Stalinist tradition, which is not characterized by contention. But otherwise, we are talking about contentious traditions which are driven from within. So just as much as when, when we read Kant, we know he's also a racist. Just as when we read Hegel, we also know that he dismisses our parts of the world, but we still read him. Similarly, when we talk about our traditions, we're also conscious of the fact that the multiple contradictions, the layers of argument, as also those springs of hope and possibility. And that's what we need to recover now, which we haven't even bothered to, because a lot of our theoretical enterprise is premised on our knowledge of one language. It's based on monolingualism. And that's how our universities are constructed as well. We, it's a one language. Right? All the languages that all of you bring into the university are kept at the doorstep. And so an entire experience and an entire conceptual vocabulary is kept at the doorstep. That's the question that I'm trying to address. Thanks, Dilla. I think we're going to have a long debate on Kerala. I also studied the Communist Party in Kerala as my PhD, but years later. Um, okay, and okay, one. So just a lone one this time. Oh no. Okay, suddenly. Okay, we have one, two, three, four. Remember your numbers. Uh, and and introduce six, yourself. Number five. I work for government. Um, in, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, in, uh, and the treasury. <laughs> in the beginning, you, you mentioned that one of the core roots of any Marxism is methodology, and you spoke about the thesis on Feuerbach. Um, and I suppose uh, in Lenin you had kind of what is to be done and the party of professional revolutionaries. And in Gramsci, you had the modern prince. In Fanon, I don't know, maybe you have the radical intellectuals. But isn't the problem of any Marxism today, or the, the absence of that root, the, that I don't know whether it's a postmodern prince, but there doesn't seem to be a form of party or uh, conscious agent that is struggling. Or, or, Marxists seem to be struggling with this, let me put it like this. So in South Africa, NUMSA is having these debates about the workers, uh, let me not paraphrase them, they're having debates about this, what form should it take. We have degeneration of the parties of former national liberation. We have new parties that call themselves Marxist, Leninist, Panonian, uh, like the EFF. We have attempts to create some, in my view, depoliticized bourgeois civil society that will take on the state. Uh, but really, there doesn't seem to be any concept or debate in Marxism about this modern prince. And won't that lead to this tree uh, itself decaying? Thanks, Michael. Number two. So, Gavin Capps from SWAP, which, whatever it was in the past, is not the vanguard of Marxism now, but it does have Marxist in it. Um, so, you wanted a debate, Michael, and you said you bought your Marx books. So, actually, I want to question the way that you, that you talk about Marx. So, you had your wonderful tree, and one of the branches coming off the tree is Russian Marxism, and then it dies at the end with what you call Soviet Marxism, later Marxist Leninism, but which I prefer to call the Stalinism. That's fine. But the problem then becomes, what you seem to do is to take a Stalinist conception of Marx and give that as what Marx actually was and what Marx was about. 
So you take a small passage written in 1859 in the preface to the contribution to the critique of political economy, which has been rarefied and by the Second International and then consequently by Stalinism as Marx's first and last word on the historical process and the relationship between base and superstructure. Yet this was written under the pen of a censor. And the point I want to make is, just as Marxism should be a living, involving and multiple tradition, so was Marx himself. What he wrote in 1859 was not the same as what he was writing in the 1870s. And it's very clear that soon afterwards, even if he held to that model, he had abandoned it in favour of one which said, actually, there are many roads to capitalism. This was on the basis of an incredible reading of world history, big engagement with Russian Marxists at the time. Here, as you say, we're in a predominantly agrarian <coughs> country. We're trying to struggle with, with questions there. But also with America, which, what was America at the time? It was one of the frontiers of capitalism, but it was also a colonial country, or had been built on slavery and genocide. So that implies actually a much richer and more complex Marx than the one is portrayed. So I think actually you're slipping into a caricature there, and I don't think we, sh we should put it across that this is actually who Marx was. Thanks, Gavin. Okay, number three. Uh, I really liked Dylan's intervention and his provocation around sort of centrality of the particular. And if I kind of take what he's saying, his intellectual project, into a sort of Pannonian register, not a Gramscian register, uh, you know, I think it resonates with, with Fanon in many, many ways. I mean, in The Wretched of the Earth, you know, Fanon is making this powerful call for decolonization. And, and I think in that context, he's, he's talking about uh, connecting with the particular. In his final chapter in that book, when he's turning his back on Europe, he's holding together two things. He's holding together the universal, and he still affirms the need to engage with the TCs from the West. But at the same time, he's also saying, we've got to find something different. And so I think even, even from that perspective, uh, from that kind of Marxist perspective, there's common ground with you. But my question is this, is that, you know, I think the subaltern out there today is not waiting for us. The wretched of the earth is not waiting uh, for us, given the kind of violence, the expansion of global capitalism today. The rise of peasant movements in Latin America are very interesting in the Andes. They are using indigenous resources. Buen vivir, uh, the concept of living well, as part of their cosmology to fight capitalism today and putting forward alternatives. Uh, the idea of rights of Mother Earth coming from peasant movements. I think that's also very interesting to bring into it. Thanks. Um, so, if I speak to you, I won't raise, I'll have to speak over here, sorry. Uh, Sam Ashman University of Johannesburg. Firstly, I agree with Gavin about 1859, so I won't repeat that. But I would just like to press you a little bit more about uh, global capitalism, because I think it's very important, because Whilst it's true that in your tree there are intellectual discussions within Marxism, the intellectual discussions and the disagreements are often about how you interpret changes in the world. And so, you know, we're, we're analysing and, and resisting evolving global capitalism. So we've got a moving target. And so obviously, so obviously the, the discussions are not simply about, about theory. They, the, the discussions develop over how you interpret changes in, in, in capitalism. So therefore, the question of how you interpret changes in global capitalism is really important. And then so I would push you on the question of production and precarity, because it seems to me we have to understand the relationship between changes in production and the creation of precarity. Because we can't understand precarity as though it's somehow this separate sphere which is not connected to changes in production. And whilst I don't have time to talk about it, Clearly, it seems to me, understanding changes in production and precarity, we can't do without some analysis of finance and global changes in finance, which are changing investment patterns and employment patterns, and are very importantly tying together you know, the City of London decisions with what happens in rural Limpopo. Thanks, Sam. Number five. Hi. My name is Steve Abbott. I'm from the University of Oxford. And it's building on that question precisely, which is that which, my question is really about the future. During the seminars this week, we talked about how Marx doesn't really elucidate much beyond capitalism. He leaves us kind of at the doorstep. My question is, as this tree has grown, what have we been, what, where have we arrived in terms of visions for the future? And is there any unity between these different branches understanding of, of what this underdeveloped theory of transition and this underdeveloped theory of socialism, as you've mentioned, Marx there. Um, do Fanon 
and Gramsci share anything in their interpretation of what happens after the revolution. Thank you. Okay, is there any last question? Because this is the last round. So I'm really keen to end on time. Are you my audience? No. Okay. So, um, Philip, did you want to? So I'm going to let Michael say the very have the, the, the final say. So, if you want to say anything, we're not sure. No, he doesn't really want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> let me hang myself. Okay, <laughs> okay then Michael. Okay. Um, yes, those are all very good questions. Yes. Um, right, the first question about uh, the modern prince. Now, the, great, the great idea of the modern prince is, it is, it is unelab in some ways unelaborated. I and mean, I think the big question of today, and it perhaps links to the last question, is what is the modern prince today? What is the permanent persuader that will, in a sense, galvanize collective action that will protect and expand uh, humanity's place on Earth. And, well, I think this is, be, is hotly debated in any social movement. Um, and today, of course, I mean, it's interesting, this last year has seen, I mean, if I were giving this talk, you know, as I was two years ago, it would have a different flavor than given what has happened over the last year, when one thinks of Brazil, when one thinks of well, this what's happened in the United Kingdom, if one thinks of, uh, of Turkey, if one thinks of so many countries today, and indeed India too, where we have right-wing movements and we have left-wing movements. Um, and, uh, and so asking the question, what is the modern prince today? What would lead to a more humane form uh, of, of, of economic and political relations is that, is that a crucial one? But I do think the social movements are actually asking that question, and some are very antagonistic, many of them, to the idea of a vanguard party. Um, some are very much oriented to horizontalism. Fanon himself, I think, one of these most, uh, uh, as I think Vish was suggesting, one of these most evocative parts of the wretched of the earth is precisely his attempt to understand what the party might be in the future. Um, and what would be a modern prince is certainly one that em embraces a democratic participation and as a mutual education, you know, the educators too have to be educated. That's quite central to Fanon's ideas and very much an anti-vanguardist position. And just thinking about also, but Fanon had also some interesting things, didn't say explicitly deal with Islam, but you know, he does have this, this amazing essay, controversial essay on the veil, which of course, you know, it's a metaphor. Well, it's a metaphor, but it's also a reality of actually the liberation struggle in which he was involved. So, the, so there, there, there are definitely uh, experiential moments to his understanding of, uh, of struggle. Yes, so I'm not really answering who is the modern prince, but I think I agree with you, that is what we have to be, that's the big question that we have to be asking. Is, can there be a modern prince in the modern world? Can there be any unifying vision? And with that, is that unified vision somehow restricted, in a sense, to regions? That's, that's, that seems like an important question. Gavin, yes, of course, you're absolutely right. The point about the, 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 the roots is that they're multiple, and you actually have different interpretations of Marx. I, I just, I use this preface to set up, basically, the connection of Gramsci and Fanon. That is how, why I use, I should have been that much clearer, I, and you're absolutely right to point out that there are multiple uh, Marxes, there's Engels and there's Marx, and indeed I, Vish was been feeding me with this book by Kevin Anderson that basically, I, so it basically explicates what Marx thought about different parts of the world, not least Russia, but India, but Ireland, and so on, and, and, and in that book shows how his later writings do suggest that there are different roads to and perhaps after capitalism. And I am not denying any of that. Uh, I was just using this as, because Gra the point really is, I suppose, that Gramsci himself uses that as his point of departure. Even though he has, of course, in his philosophy of praxis, he talks about the thesis on Feuerbach, and his whole methodology is based on that, uh, on a reading of those theses, very much against Bukharin's sort of positivist uh, Marxism. Yes, yeah, so yeah, I give you all that, and uh, yeah, then let there be a thousand flowers bloom on the roots of my tree. Um, which is a response to your 
Come on, yes. All right. Ah, yes. Um, oh, what's this word? Uh, Fanon, particular. Um, that was Tadilla, though. Yes, okay. Well, that was, was that number three? Were you number three? Oh, good. Okay. All right. Do it. Right. Um, the, yes, the, the, the debates about global capitalism. And yes, I think that, yes, I. When I talked about the Polanyian Marxism and the emphasis on the experience of the markets, the one thing that Polanyi himself in the Great Transformation fails to do because he is being very critical of a positivistic Marxism, he fails to develop a theory of capitalism that makes markets in a sense necessary. And I think we have to look at three ways of marketization. We're in a third one at the moment. And the way capitalist accumulation generates marketization. We have to, in a sense, think about the long ways within capitalism, Kondratia ways, and the way that they generate the particular forms of commodification. That would be my strategy. I certainly have not done it. But that would be the way to go. So that would link your production to your precarity. Yes, right. Um, whoo, hmm, visions of the future. Well, I think that's perfectly great thing, great question. Ooh, where was the... Ah, David, yeah. Uh, <coughs> look, I think that capitalism today systematically obliterates the possibility, the, the idea of alternatives. And so I think it's incumbent upon uh, intellectuals to actually begin to, not begin to, to continue to and devote much attention to visions of alternatives. Now, those alternatives have to appeal to people as somehow reasonable and possible. And I think the way to do that, and it's good that Eric Wright is following me, because I'm sure he will tell you all about this much better than I could ever do so, but the idea of actually working with institutions, organizations, that actually contain visions that are, in a sense, anti-capitalist, or seem to challenge capitalism, whether it's universal incomes grant, whether it's participatory budgeting, and whether it's his favorite, and I guess it's Fish's and Mish's uh, favorite uh, cooperatives. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. It doesn't, these are experiential moments that can intellectuals can elaborate the conditions of their existence, their internal contradictions, and the possibilities of their dissemination. That is certainly one way. I myself go in a different direction. I examine because I spent quite a lot of my time, many years, participating in and studying what we now call, what I call, state socialism in Hungary. And, and then, well, it was actually a very short period in, in Russia before it collapsed under my, my influence. Um, uh, but, but what I found, what is so interesting about state socialist societies is the way that they generated oppositional movements that actually embraced the concept of socialism. Many of them, and the Solidarity Movement is a good example, embraced and said to the ruling class, you give us, you say you've got socialism, just egalitarian and efficient, but we see some society core, some society that is unjust, unjust, inegalitarian and inefficient. They engage in an imminent critique of the dominant ideology to which they are subject and generate all sorts of fascinating alternative socialisms from below. Whether it's the Council Communism of 1956 in Hungary, even the late perestroika period in Russia can be seen in this light, or the Solidarity Movement in Poland. But as intellectuals, I think it is incumbent upon us to actually develop visions of alternatives, particularly in this moment in history. So our challenge is, on the one hand, to get generate visions of alternatives, and on the other hand, begin try to develop a collectively a vision of capitalism that does make sense in different parts of the world. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. All right. Um, well, thank you. I first want to thank the audience. You guys were great, and you saved till 7 o'clock. I want to give a special thanks to Michael and Dillip. I think you were both fantastic. Um, and I know where you stand now. Um, so thank you. Just, I think one more, two more things. Just quickly, remember August 4th,
4th at 12 o'clock, we will have Eric Bowen Wright and Sarah Mosuetza um, as the respondent. And I've been requested, and this is to take seriously, please take your glasses and trash out of this venue. It helps those of us who have to clean it up. Um, and Rashlako and Swazi have asked me to announce that. So please take your glasses and put them outside on the table there, and your trash will put trash bin. Thank you, and good night.